So in this video, we're going to review attention pneumothorax, its clinical manifestations, its pathophysiology, how we differentiate between other disorders, and how we can benefit these patients. Because if you look at some stats, 50% of all trauma-related deaths have something to do with their chest, because obviously it houses a variety of and significant organs that we need to survive, right? And if you have an isolated chest trauma, the lethality of the injury is about five to 8%, which is quite substantial. However, they've done some studies, it's correlated. If we do a needle thoracostomy in the pre-hospital setting, you reduce their chances of dying within 24 hours of in-hospital admission by 25%, which is quite significant, right? And they've compared that to receiving a chest tube within 15 minutes of in-hospital arrival. Needle thoracostomy, when applied timely and appropriately, is truly a potential life-saving maneuver. This is why it's always good to review, right? So we look at causes. Obviously, in this case study, it was the result of a gunshot wound that leads to this open kind of communication from the outside world and allows the air to get in, but it can't escape because that one-way valve-like effect, right? That's different from a closed pneumothorax where there is that no open communication. So open pneumothorax, these can be caused by gunshot wounds, penetrating trauma, stab wounds, etc., right? You can also have bare trauma leading to attention pneumothorax, such as like kind of a rare example, someone scuba dives, comes up too quick, causes their collapsed lung. Then you have like a spontaneous. So this disproportionately affects kind of young, skinny, tall male patients, especially those with Marfan syndrome, or if you just have patients that have significant lung disorders, right? Like COPD, asthma, they could be at higher risk for developing attention pneumothorax. Medical procedures. If you need a lung biopsy, there is a slight risk of getting a pneumothorax, right? It can happen. And obviously, there's a spectrum of degrees of pneumothoraxes. And because if you just have a simple pneumothorax, it's quite different than the tension pneumothorax because simple doesn't have that one way valve effect. It doesn't cause this pressure buildup that twists all your great vessels and kind of pushes your trachea away. Those are different. You have normal amount of atmospheric pressure in them, but with a tension pneumothorax, you have this increased amount of pressure in your chest that exceeds the atmospheric pressure that kind of collapses everything and disrupts our cardiorespiratory status and eventually death if not rectified. And positive pressure ventilation. So if we are overzealous, over vigorous with our ventilations, especially those patients that are high risk of tension pneumothorax disease or collapsed lungs, such as cystic fibrosis, COPD, asthma, that can lead to a tension pneumothorax. And that's just why we will have to be diligent and judicious when we ventilate patients. So overall, we know that a tension pneumothorax develops because you have an accumulation of air in the plural space, which is the called potential space, right? Because we have the serous membrane that adheres to our lungs. So the layer that actually is right on contact of our lung is the visceral pleural. That the one layer that goes, that outlines the chest cavity, that's the parietal pleural. And in that space, you have the pleural space, and this is where air can accumulate. This is where blood can also accumulate and or both, right? Because when you get attention tension pneumothorax, you have a disruption of your lung tissue or your parietal pleural. And this can lead to air to get in, but because of usually this flap of lung damaged tissue, it causes this one way valve effect. So air can get in, but it cannot get out. So imagine your tire, you have that valve on your tire of your cars, air can get in, but it can't escape. So air just keeps accumulating every time you breathe in, every time you provide a positive pressure ventilation, etc. This leads to this excessive amount of pressure building up in their chest. So their lung cannot expand eventually. And this actually leads to it collapse. And now that lung can't participate in gas exchange, which is problematic, right? So then you have the clinical manifestation. So if you look at the literature, the most common signs of uh, attention pneumothorax is usually dyspnea and pleuroleritic chest pain, right? So it's worse on inspiration, et cetera, when palpation. That's the same with just a simple pneumothorax. Those are the true main signs. It's been historically taught they'll have JBD and attention pneumothorax. That's not truly a cardinal sign because one, some subsets of chest trauma patients usually will have maybe a hemoneumo. As well as if you have significant major trauma, you probably have some other injuries that you could be manifest during your experiencing hemorrhagic shock, right? So you probably don't have sufficient amount of blood flow to actually create this jugular vein distension because it's usually caused by when you have this rise of interthoracic pressure because that one way valve effect, you constrict your blood vessels, especially the vena cava. The venous system is a low pressure system at rest. It only takes about five to 15 millimeters of mercury to actually twist off your vena cava, right? Which is nothing at all. So imagine you turn on your garden hose and you just kind of bend it and twist it. Obviously water will not flow appropriately 
that's kind of the same thing. So if less blood is going back to your heart, that's a reduction of blood that gets distributed around your body. And as well, this causes a rise in systemic venous pressure and that manifests with jugular vein distension. However, we just kind of alluded to it. If less blood's going back to your heart and less blood's being distributed around your body, you're going to have, be hypotensive and that's going to lead to hypoperfusion, which leads to anaerobic metabolism, disrupts all your cellular processes, etc. right? And is extremely problematic. Cyanosis. If your lung's not participating in gas exchange, and eventually the pressure in your chest builds up so much that your actual mediastinum starts twisting into the unaffected side, that's going to obstruct gas exchange in that lung as well too, right? And if you have less blood that's being oxygenated going around your body, this is going to lead to cyanosis. So if patients have cyanosis in their fingertips and peripheries, that's an output problem. But if you are, have cyanosis around your mucous membranes, you are systemically hypoxic, which is an a severely sick patient. So tracheal deviation, this is kind of more of a textbook sign or a light sign. Like it's very rare to probably see that in the pre-hospital setting, maybe chest x-rays, etc. But again, it can happen, especially if pressure builds up enough. So it gets so accumulated in the chest, it pushes them onto the unaffected side. Then you get the subcutaneous emphysema. So I don't know if many people have actually felt this. You have to be quite methodical and diligent in finding it because it just means air is trapped under the or in the subcutaneous spaces, usually from a tension pneumothorax, and it feels like that crackling sound. So again, you have to be very methodical to do it. And respiratory distress. So respiratory distress, dyspnea, and pleuritic chest pain are the main clinical manifestations of a tension pneumothorax. So if we look here, this is called a boule. So this is like basically like a blister on the outside of your lung. And this is kind of like and similar to a blood. So that's bare in them. If it's less than one centimeter, it's usually constituted as a blood. If it's over one centimeter in size, it's called a boule. But if you have a blister, it's prone to rupturing, right? So imagine you have COPD and you blow a blue boule that leads to a tension pneumothorax. That can be problematic, right? So again, boules and blabs are kind of like blisters on the outside of your lung. So we already kind of spoke to this. You have this damage to your lung tissue or your pleural, and this allows the air to get in, but it cannot get it. So it creates this one-way valve effect, especially if you have lung tissue like blocking the communication of air to the leave, right? So every time they breathe in, every time we provide positive pressure ventilation, that traps more air in. So eventually pressure starts building up above atmospheric pressure. And when this creates an increase in intrathoracic pressure, this leads to the mediastinum being pushed to the opposite side. And eventually, the pressure in the chest exceeds intrapulmonary pressure and the lung cannot expand and it collapses. Then uh, if you look at the other side, the cardiovascular implications again, if you increase the pressure in your chest, that twists off your great vessels and vena cava, that leads to hypotension and eventually cardiorespiratory arrest, if not rectified in a timely manner. So we kind of just examine the actual alveoli. Obviously, that's where gas exchange occurs. Oxygen comes down, crosses the alveolar capillary membrane. 98.5% of all of our oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, which gets distributed around our body. The rest of it is dissolved in plasma, but that's our normal alveoli. Imagine you have a tension pneumothorax. Now the affected side collapses the lung. That's what your alveoli actually looks like now. So obviously that is not that optimal for gas exchange to occur. So oxygen can't really cross the alveolar capillary membrane. You have a drop in your oxygen, drop in your oxygen saturation. This leads to respiratory distress to compensate. So they got very labored breathing. And eventually this leads to cyanosis if it's not rectified. So overall tension pneumothorax leads to a respiratory shunt if they just have a tension pneumo alone because you have normal amounts of blood flow. However, you have a reduction amount of oxygen because you need this equal amounts of blood flow and oxygenation to maintain our homeostasis. But if you have an alteration one or the other, that can lead to detrimental effects. So you obviously have a reduction in ventilation and oxygenation, and this leads to respiratory shunt. So as you can see here, the great vessels are collapsed and compressed and this leads to a, a tracheal shift. I should correct this because historically we're taught the second intercostal space mid clavicular line is the a site that we utilize in these patients experiencing a tension pneumothorax. However, they've done a variety of different studies. And again, it's kind of hard to do a randomized controlled trial with needle torcostomy. So a lot of this is cadaver studies, but they've determined between the fourth intercostal space into your axial line, the second intercostal space had a higher failure rate, approximately five to 40% of the time. The main reasons for it is because the chest or the chest wall size of the patient because of obesity, improper needle selection and improper location, etc. So that's going to be problematic because you in the fourth intercostal space into your axillary site, that site actually has a higher success rate, lower complications, and to actually hit the pleural space.
However, in adult patients in our catchment area, you still can use the second intercostal space depending on the patient's injuries, your comfort ladder, logistics. You still can use the site, just talking about why, but again, the fourth intercostal space into your axillary line is the preferred site. However, pediatrics is different. For our catchment area, we just want one preferred site, which is the fourth intercostal anterior axillary site. And anyone that's 13 years and older should get the 12 gauge or 14 gauge needle. And under 13, you can use a 14 gauge or 16 gauge needle. However, it is recommended to put a 10 cc syringe on all your chest needles because you can draw up saline and when you hit the bubbles, you know you're in the pleural space, but you should advance it that little more, like an ID catheter, like one to two millimeters. So you're sure you're actually in the pleural space then you thread the catheter off the needle because again that has the higher success rate and especially the younger pediatrics their thymus their great vessels are close proximity to the second intercostal space so there is a risk for hydrogenic air but the literature can actually establish a true risk and estimation of hydrogenic air in pediatric chest needles but nonetheless we should be quite cognizant and utilize that 10 cc c syringe with saline on it to mitigate any adverse events the great thing about the fourth intercostal space into your axillary line, you can do it within the triangle. So you have this ability to kind of maneuver around. So you should align it with the anterior axillary, which is usually the armpit line, and if anatomically correct around the nipple line, etc. And you do it in that triangle, and we do it around there, just above the rib, to avoid the nerve vascular bundle, which encompasses a bunch of vein, artery, and the nerve, which we'll show you momentarily. People have been asking, especially in pediatrics, what if you physically can't landmark it due to the patient's injuries in, in that area? So it is recommended that even though it would be quite rare, you can just do a blind insertion. So estimate where the actual fourth intercostal space into your axillary line is. And if you hit the rib, just walk above it because you know there's an intercostal space there. That's okay if you hit the rib, just walk above it and you will find the intercostal space. That is no problem at all. So that's why it is recommended pediatrics have just the one site for simplicity and just higher success rate. So here you can see the intercostal bundles. So you have the ribs here, you have the intercostal vein, the intercostal artery and the intercostal nerve. Obviously we wanna go above the rib so we don't damage any of those areas because that, that could lead to adverse events. And if you just compare it to a spontaneous pneumothorax, patients usually just manifest with pleuritic chest pain. It happens all of a sudden, whether it's from trauma or just spontaneous, from just being that disproportionately tall male patient, especially with Marfan syndrome, you will have diminished your absent breath times on the affected side. Because again, if your lung collapses, you're not having good gas exchange. It's not going to create these pronounced lung sounds that we normally hear in healthy lung tissues, etc. There also is that hyper resonance. So if you tap, you kind of hear echoing. That's not really relevant in the pre-hospital setting. It would be hard to hear, especially in pretty busy trauma calls or in the back of the ambulance. So if you look at spontaneous pneumothorax, these are pleural pressures atmospheric, so it's equal, but in tension pneumothorax, it's higher than atmospheric, and this is why you get this one-way bowel effect and compresses everything and pushes everything away. Jugular vein distension, again, it's kind of rare. It could be probably normal in a spontaneous pneumothorax or a simple one. It might be elevated, but in comparison, you get this tension one-way valve effect. You get dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, JVV, possibly distended unless they're truly in hemorrhagic shock as well. You don't have enough volume to create that rise in systemic venous pressure. And you have absent, severely diminished breath sounds on the affected side. And pleural pressure is positive and increased with every inspir inspiration. So overall, this video is to review tension pneumothorax, how we treat it, the pathophysiology, the clinical manifestations, some differentials. And the last kind of point is, what if someone has a diaphragmic herniation? Because this could lead to hard to distinguish, I should say, in the pre setting, because you have absent or severely diminished breath sounds on the affected sides. It usually happens on the left side because the right side has the liver in place that kind of prevents that, but they will also have other symptoms like disfigured abdomen, etc. But truly, it can be hard to distinguish. Just kind of use all the rationale, the mechanism, of injury, what other symptoms do they have, and treat accordingly. But this video was just going to review the evidence as well of the chest needles, how it can benefit. We should do them properly. We should practice them so we can be quite judicious and give optimal patient management for trauma patients because they have high rates of mortality and morbidity. Thank you.